everyone. Hello, everyone. I'm Phyllis Kim, Executive Director of CARE, which stands for Comfort Women Action for Redress and Education. I want to welcome all of you and thank you for joining us on a Saturday night or Sunday morning here in Seoul. I especially want to thank each of our distinguished panelists who are sharing their time and expertise with us today. I will leave it to Senator Min to have the pleasure of introducing each of them in more detail. Well, I expect that everyone joining today is familiar with Professor Mark Rendier's paper and has been following along with the developments. So I won't provide more background on that. This round table is really an opportunity for you all to hear directly from these experts in their respective areas of history, language and culture studies, law and economics as peers of Professor Renjire within the academic community. I hope you all find the discussion to be productive and collegial. I also want to reiterate that our organization does not support personal attacks on Professor Renjire. Our concerns are solely about the substance of his work. For those new to us, we are a 501c3 nonprofit based in Los Angeles and Seoul. We focus on advocacy, education, and redress efforts on behalf of the Comfort Women. You can learn more about our work at comfortwomenaction.org. Recently, we've been working closely with one of the survivors, Yi Yong Su Harmony, on her plea for referring comfort women issue to the UN International Court of Justice or ICJ. She is one of the last 15 known comfort women survivors in South Korea and one of the few who can still speak for themselves. Yi Yong Su Harmony is here with us today so you can all can hear from her directly later on. In the near future, we will be having some events on international law and ICJ issues, as well as on some primary sources and historical records and evidence. So please look out for updates on those topics. We have a lot to talk about. So I'll end here and turn this over to California State Senator Dave Min, who represents State District 37. He will be moderating the discussion and questions for our panelists today. Thank you. Thank you, Phyllis, for the warm introduction and for getting up so early in Korea to take part in this. Uh, it's an honor to moderate this important discussion. I want to give a special thank you to Stephanie Lee and the CARE team uh, for your advocacy and hard work in making this event happen. I also want to thank my staff that uh, really also was critical to making this uh, uh, event occur. I want to give a welcome to everyone tuning in from the United States and South Korea. Uh, as Phyllis mentioned, my name is Dave Min, and I am California's state senator, one of 40. Uh, I represent just over 1 million people in the heart of Orange County. Now, California is home to the largest population of Korean Americans in the United States. Our state is incredibly diverse, and so is my district, which covers uh, a broad terrain, including Irvine, which many people know, uh, Laguna Woods, Lake Forest, Newport Beach, uh, Laguna Beach, Huntington Beach, Tustin, Orange, and a number of other cities. California is home to arguably the most robust set of higher education institutions in the world, with the most influential public university systems, uh, the UCs and the CSUs, uh, institutions we've all heard of like Cal Berkeley, UCLA, and my former employer, UC Irvine, along with some of the top private universities around, such as Stanford and USC. Now, in recent years, we've seen a very troubling attempt to rewrite history, led by despots and autocrats around the world. In our liberal democracies, our primary defense against tyranny has been the truth, and academia has been a crucial part of that defense. When we talk about human rights and universal freedom, it is critical that we have an objective and accurate understanding of the truth, including about our history. 
One thing I find so disheartening about this incident is that it really just calls into question the integrity and standing of academic research writ large. If we can't trust the research and methodologies of an esteemed professor at Harvard Law School, uh, then who can we trust? Now, I'll let our panelists discuss the particular problems with Professor Ramsey's, uh, Ramsey's essay, uh, but I, I think that they will conclude that he uses abstract frameworks to essentially erase the lived histories of so many young girls and women's who are, women who are subjected to these unspeakable acts of violence. And that just can't stand. Uh, our uh, program today, as mentioned, includes the accounts of one survivor who will bravely share her experiences later in the program. Um, Ms. Lee Yong-Soo Hamini is one of just 15 surviving comfort women left in Korea, uh, and one of, I believe, maybe the only one who's able to communicate at this point. Tonight's not about politics. It's about setting the record straight and creating a platform for the 200,000 comfort women and girls who are not able to speak today. Uh, by bringing together leading experts in economics, history, cultural studies, and law, and creating a constructive scholastic dialogue that stands to correct falsehoods, restore academic integrity, and hopefully begin the honest work towards changing hearts and minds. I'm so grateful to our panelists for being here today. And so I have the honor of introducing our, our very esteemed panel. Uh, we have uh, just some amazing people here. And so I'll introduce each of them in turn. First, we have uh, Michael Che, um, doctor. Uh, he's an economist and professor of political science at UCLA, uh, one of the UCs I mentioned earlier. Uh, professor Che organized a petition drive to collect signatures calling for the International Review of Law and Economics uh, to take corrective measures concerning the publication of Professor Ramsey's article. As of this week, over 3,300 scholars have signed on. Professor Che will offer his views today from the perspective of those published in Law and Economics Journal and the harm this article poses to the field at large. We're also honored to be joined by Ms. Pepe Xu. Uh, she is the Louise Boyd Dale and Alfred Lichtenstein Chair and Professor of Japanese and Chinese Studies and uh, Director of Asian Studies at Vassar College in New York. Professor Xu is a expert in Japan and in China Studies and the principal author of the groundbreaking study, Chinese Comfort Women, Testimonies from Imperial Japan's Sex Slaves. Not only from Korea, but also from China and the Philippines, we saw uh, comfort women used, young girls recruited to be, or forced into slavery uh, during World War II. And Professor Xu will address the broader historical implications for us. Uh, we also have um, our third panelist, Richard Painter. Uh, you may be familiar with his Twitter account if you're uh, if someone who follows social media. Uh, Professor Painter is the S. Walter Rishi uh, Professor of Corporate Law at the University of Minnesota. He's former chief White House ethics lawyer. And in that role under George W. Bush, uh, he advised on a wide array of issues. Today, he teaches at the University of Minnesota um, in corporate law and other areas. And he's written extensively on government ethics and anti-corruption. Finally, uh, our last panelist will be Prof Dr. Professor, uh, Dr. Alexis Dudden, Duden, so excuse me, uh, professor of modern Japan, modern Korea and international history at University of Connecticut. Professor Duden is a leading expert in Japan and Korea relations. She's been a leading voice questioning Professor Ramsey's inaccuracies and denialism. She's done interviews with the New York Times and ABC among others, uh, pointing out deficiencies in Professor Ramsey's article. Uh, she'll elaborate on some of the historical aspects of Korean comfort women that were ignored by Professor Ramsey. Uh, after the panel will conclude, we'll be uh, joined by uh, Ms. Lee Yong Soo Hamani, uh, or as she's known to many, Grandma Lee, <coughs> Grandmother Lee. And as I mentioned earlier, she's one of only 15 surviving comfort women in Korea, and perhaps the only one left who's able to communicate. She'll be joining us from Korea to discuss firsthand her, the horrific experiences that she had to endure personally. Uh, Phyllis Kim, who spoke earlier, is with her personally and will provide interpretation. Uh, but with that, I wanted to turn it over to uh, Dr. Che. Dr. Che. Uh, it appears we have some technical difficulties. So why don't we uh, go with our next panelist, uh, uh, Professor Chu, uh, perhaps you could speak. Okay, sure. Um, thank you, Senator Min, for your kind um, introduction. Um, this panel is uh, focusing on the academic responsibility 
in the case of comfort women. Um, I, I believe the audience and panelists, we all uh, heard about this issue and uh, the article that published or will be published um, by Professor Ramsayer. Um, I just, there's many uh, comments has been made either on newspaper, media, online. Uh, I just want to focus on uh, the irresponsible assumptions and state statements made by Professor Ramsayer's article. It's, it's just uh, simply astonishing. And the support is of its publication raised a serious question. Can academic freedom be used as a shield to allow the violation of the academic code of conduct? One of the unacceptable aspects of the article is that the author frequently puts out an assumption as a conclusion, but never provides supporting evidence to prove that kind of assumption or conclusion. For example, in the contracting fast for sex in Pacific War, Professor Ramsayer says, the Japanese military did not need additional prostitutes. It had plenty. So when you look at how he knew about that, why he said that throughout the entire article, you simply cannot find any evidence that supports such an argument. In fact, this statement is false, even based on the documents produced by Japanese military themselves. Wartime Japanese military documents unearthed at the site of headquarters of the Guangdong Army Military Police in Changchun, China, show that at the very beginning of the full-scale warfare, the Japanese military already systematically set up comfort stations and draft an extremely large number of comfort women from both the Japanese empire and occupied regions. I just gave one example. There are two Guangdong military police reports dated February 18, 19th and 28th, 1938 which was only two months after the Nanjing massacre. These reports have special sections on comfort facilities in Nanjing and its facilities. The reports detail the numbers of soldiers and the comfort women in each city. <clears throat> One report clearly notes that at Danyang, which is a very small city near Nanjing, the troops drafted the local women to set up the comfort station due to the insufficiency of comfort women. The reports also show a rapid increase of uh, the number of comfort women between the two reporting periods. The reporting periods is 10 days apart. So at Wuhu, another small city, for example, the number increased, number of comfort women in increased from 25 to 100 nine in 10 days. Japanese military's massive abduction of women from the occupied regions in China continued throughout the Asia Pacific War. A 1941 journal article reported that at the military comfort station at Tongcheng, Hubei province in China, the, I'm, I'm citing the, uh, the article contents. Most of the women who are used as the comfort objects in the comfort station are drafted by force from the local area by the Association for Maintaining Order. Uh, by the way, this is a puppet administrative agency formed by the Japanese occupation army. These women are allowed to go home after being enslaved in the comfort station for a certain time but they must have at least five warranters to, war to guarantee that they would be sent back to the station. If a released woman is not sent back three days after the due date, all the warranters and their family members would be buried alive. And the members of the Association for Maintaining Order would also be punished. 
So these are just uh, a couple of uh, documents and uh, journal reports produced during the war. Research findings like this are all available in English. When Professor Ramsier wrote his article, but he simply ignores them, particularly those findings concerning the women abducted from the Japanese occupied territories. This kind of avoidance of mentioning the comfort of women rounded up from the Japanese occupied territories have been a common strategy of the history denialists who have tried to frame the issue as merely a diplomatic dispute between Japan and South Korea. This is because these women from the occupied area as Imperial Japan's enemy nationals received unspeakable brutal treatment and their experiences clearly show that the Japanese, the uh, comfort women system was military sexual slavery and war crime. In the past decades, transnational investigation in multiple countries on the occupied areas um, have demonstrated that an extremely large number of women were drafted into Japanese military comfort stations by force, by coercion, or by deception. The majority of them receive no monetary payment. And in many cases, their family were forced to pay a large sum to the Japanese military in order to rescue their daughters. Even though some comfort women received money, when they were recruited or given a percentage of uh, the service fees in advance, these women were held captive and forced to provide sexual services to the soldiers continually. Therefore, the monetary payment does not change the coercive nature, criminal aid nature of the comfort woman system at all. When our research on subjects that involve the survivors and the victims of violence and the war, we are bound not only by the academic code of conduct, but also the fundamental principle of humanity. Yeah. I wonder when Professor Ramsayer stated that the comfort of women's sex slave story is pure fiction. Did he ever care to talk to the survivors or read any of their testimonies? I yeah. think I will stop here. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Dr. Xu, and that's a great point. I uh, want to make sure we leave some time for our other panelists. Dr. Che, uh, welcome back. Sorry, thank you. Um, I don't know what happened to my internet, but uh, I guess I'm back, so I appreciate um, I really appreciate everyone who's organized this event, Senator Min and uh, um, Phyllis Kim and uh, Yi Yongsi Hamani. And, um, you know, uh, it's really, really learning experience for me. I mean, I'm not like, you know, Professor Chu or Professor Dudden, I'm not a specialist on, you know, the issue of uh, um, militarized sexual slavery in during World War II. Um, I am a game theorist, so um, I first heard about this whole issue from a Facebook post from Phyllis saying that somebody used game theory to talk about, you know, the idea that the women who were enslaved were voluntary. And I thought, what the heck is this? I don't know what's going on. Then, then I just sort of thought this is some sort of strange thing. And then um, one of my friends, an economist, uh, Young Guche at Columbia. He emailed and saying, hey, we really have to do something about this. And he got several people together, including um, Alex Lee at, in the law school at Northwestern and Albert Che, who was at University of Michigan in the law school there. And, um, and several other people associated with the uh, Korean American, Korean, Korea America Economic Association. And um, so he said, we really have to do something because you know, this person is basically trying to use game theory, use log and law and economics. He actually used the word game theory in his paper and he publishes in law and economics journal. He's trying to use these things, which we care deeply about, to basically, like um, Professor Chu said, just deny an entire um, historical atrocity of a huge one. It's really the equivalent of um, Holocaust denialism. And um, so we said, because we have to do something about this. So we decided to write a letter and we decided that 
like so many people have said, the main issue really is education. And I think one of the earlier comments somebody um, emailed to us before this event was, how do we get awareness of this in all society to the level of understanding like the Holocaust? So for example, I think everyone, I think, accepts that the Holocaust happened. It was a terrible thing. And it has an implication for us, not just as, you know, gypsies or gay people or Jews, but it has implications for us as human beings. So assembly, I think that we shouldn't think of this issue as like some sort of uh, thing among Asia or Korea, Japan or something like that. It's really, you know, I think Professor Dunn once told me this is really the largest systematized um, phenomenon of sexual coercion, human trafficking in the 20th century in terms of scale. So with this really implicates us as human beings, period. This is something which we all, as an educated human being, should understand and should know about. And we have to get it to that level. And when you look at the Jewish community, they worked really, really hard over many years to educate people about the Holocaust. And this is what we really need to do. So I see that as the main long-term goal. Anyhow, so um, we, a group of economists, wrote this letter and we decided to try to get signatures. We originally thought we'd only get like a few hundred, but, you know, these days with, you know, we did it on, um, we made a link and used Google Forms. Um, we were really surprised that we got a lot of responses, including from some from the very top people in the field, people who edit the best journals in economics. And um, some people have asked me, why did you get such rapid um, responses? We got like a thousand signatures in the first week. And I think the reason is because it is actually a very simple thing to understand, which is that um, we should use economics and game theory to legitimize atrocities. <laughs> and we, if we care about economics and game theory like I do, that's really hurtful to us. And we don't want people to think of game theory as, as, or economics as one of these things. And, um, you know, the more we got into it, you know, we're not as trained as, as historians as, as, of course, historians, but we started looking at the sources too. And of course, every scholar, you know, being true to the cited sources this is a value for any scholar, not just historians. And there are a lot of things which you don't have to learn, you know, Korean or English or Japanese. You just, you just read it and it's like, Ramsar is, saying the opposite of what the source says. And it's just right there. It's not, it's not difficult. You don't have to be a specialist just in some sense. And it's like, whoa. And then, then the whole kind of thing of like academic dishonesty, you know, scholarly uh, um, malpractice kind of came up and we're thinking, you know, this is not just somebody telling something immoral, but it's also malpractice. And now people, most historians are looking at his other papers, even going back to the 1990s and thinking, hmm, there might be an issue with this guy's entire scholarly corpus. And we have to, of course, you know, think about this in a very careful way, but I think now that there's a lot of attention on this, now we have to really think about this carefully. So um, anyway, so I think for most people, you know, it's sort of almost overdetermined. Like we sent, in our letter, we said, you know, this bike guy is basically making something up. And then another very famous economist, Penelope Goldberg, who's former chief economist of the World Bank, former editor of the field's most important journal, the American Economic, American Economic Review. She said, well, you know, even if we take what, Ramsari said it's given. He says in a journal that it's possible for a 10 year old girl to consent to be a sex worker. So he, the, the example he cites is wrong. So he says that, you know, the girl he cites consented, but in the source, she, had, she says, no, opposite. She, in the source, she actually says, you know, you fooled us. But even if you take that as given, he actually, he actually says it's possible that, you know, he, she knew what he was doing. So she, in other words, it's not just about some sort of historical thing. What's going on in this paper is basically like what so many like people who sexually harass, sexually assault, they do to their victims. They say, well, you wanted to, you agreed to it. He's, he's doing that to hundreds of thousands of people. And this is not just about a historical thing. This is just about a, a technique which assaulters and harassers have used from time immemorial. And we're basically saying, allowing him to do it in a scholarly journal talking about a 12 year old child. So. You know, so there's many, many things which, and I also want to be, to be very clear, I mean, as a game theorist, there, this is, I think, a problem which is, comes up, which sometimes historians say, well, you know, the story doesn't make sense, history doesn't make sense, there's no, you know, there's scholarly my practice in terms of historical sources, but maybe some game theory stuff makes sense. And I'm here to say, there's almost no game theory in this article which makes sense or is good. It's, it is not publishable, in my opinion, on the basis of game theory. It's very, very little. In fact, the worst thing about it is that it uses it in such a superficial and way and as just as if to cover as to use a, co a cover of expertise to kind of you know give you some sort of scholarly patina or some sort of scholarly gloss and that to me is terrible you, you shan't you couldn't do that and that's again misusing what game theory is about misusing using what economics is about and i and i think so many many people many scholars reacted very strongly to this so i think that's why we got so many signatures and um 
you know, I guess we'll talk about this soon, but like one of the obvious questions is like, how did the journal accept this? Um, you know, I guess it's sorry to say, but the, the scholarly standards and basically the, the standards of review at some journals are it's not that high. And, uh, um, you know, I think the issue is more about the journal, to be honest, if, you know, the, the grounds for retraction are multiple and strong. And in terms of like, again, sort of the morality of the issue, scholarly malpractice, this misuse, misuse of game theory, and also just the fact that certain claims are made in the article without any kind of um, backing at all. So I just don't get it. I, mean, I must say, I mean, I think that, you know, we are trying to do our best to kind of talk to the associate editors, to the editors and say, hey, you know, do the right thing and attract the article. But if they don't, I mean, it's really, to me, a problem. I mean, it's much, much worse for there to be a journal which openly yeah. proclaims to not really follow scholarly standards than it is for one person to be kind of a crazy person. So, I mean, that's my concern. So, yeah. I appreciate that. And I look forward to hearing a little bit more. And sure. I, I, I do want to hear a little bit more about the, the particulars of game, the, the problems with from a game theory perspective uh, in, a, in a few minutes. Uh, our next panelist um, is Professor Duden. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, I, I'll be really quick here just to pick up on what professors Chu and Che have just said. Uh, the, the, the use of uh, economic and game theory as cover uh, is, you know, Michael's first response uh, Pepe's first response is the evidence ignored. And I, I think those two words are really what most in the field responded to is this is, you know, we've got 30 years of scholarship on a history that happened 70, 80 years ago. And the article presented as a scholarly article almost appears as if Professor Ramsayer believes he's the first person to wander into this field and present it as a new topic. So that's the first takeaway. And many of us, when we keep saying we were shocked, we were shocked, um, we shouldn't be shocked. This is denialism 101. And he's used all the strategies. And the, the trick is because of the lack of evidence, you have to be familiar with the evidence to know that he's then just parroting denialist uh, dog whistles, as we now say in the United States, for the right wing in Japan. Uh, this is the current ruling party in Japan. This is a political platform that dominates the airwaves and, and governance in Japan. And part of the problem is for many people, you know, it's not even just a lack of awareness about this particular history, it's a lack of awareness that Japan is as divided a society as the United States, as many places around the world today, and that this particular topic is, is sort of the one, if not the main topic that divides Japanese society. And that's what this is a call to. And so I, I would, you're, please welcome, you're in my living room. It's my Zoom room, it's my living room. I was sitting here on December 13th when Professor Ramsayer sent me together with five of my colleagues, the PDF of this article. And I, 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 I still can shake because I was in such shock from, from the opening paragraph on because you know it, it's just it's not just full of falsehoods it's full of targeted drop words particularly the naming the use of the term prostitute that's something that has been going on since the 1980s early 1990s with a, a certain political group in Japan that refuses even to use the term militarized sexual uh, militarized comfort woman let alone the deeper more legal term that is used at the United Nations sex slave this is a UN determined crime against humanity. And all of a sudden a professor of law at Harvard University says, oh, well that didn't happen either. And you know, we're back 30 years to square one. So I think, and I'll just be really quick because I wanna hear what Professor Painter has to say and then go into the sort of nitty gritty questions. But um, I have a very intelligent 90 year old aunt 
and uh, she was uh, she's got a biology PhD. She was dean at Bryn Mawr College, and she was listening to me rant and rave about this problem because this is consumed. You know, those of us who work on this is. And she said, "Well, why? You know, if there's if there's nothing there, why are you upset?" Because, you know, there's a problem. There's no there there. As Professor Che mentioned, there's no evidence to support economic theory. There's no evidence to support game theory. He told his colleague, Jeannie Sook Gerson from The New Yorker, that he doesn't even have a contract. So there's no evidence. So there's no there there. But that made me realize the responsibility that those of us privileged enough, especially during a pandemic, but privileged enough to have tenure at research universities this is an era of disinformation and misinformation and somebody dressing up fake news as fact and calling it scholarship that's our responsibility to call out and say this isn't academic freedom which is one of the rarest privileges in any constitutional democracy and he's hiding behind that thinking he'll get protection from that but you don't get academic freedom if you aren't honest with your evidence and there's no evidence so that's as you can tell, I'm a little worked up about this. So. No, thank you, Professor David. Mute myself now. And last but not least, uh, Professor Painter, thank you so much for joining us. You're, you're muted, Professor Painter. I'm very sorry. Thank you very much, Dave. I want to open with the observation that this is not about Korea versus Japan. Uh, we are not seeking uh, to single out uh, Japan uh, as the only country to have committed war crimes. Uh, and uh, it is really about how men uh, treat women, particularly in times of war. And uh, rape and sexual assault is one of the oldest war crimes known to human civilization. Any scholar of ancient history uh, could tell you that. Uh, and we have had sexual assault and uh, rape in uh, recent wars, including in World War II in uh, Europe, uh, the Russian soldiers entering Germany, uh, the German soldiers in World War II as well. The American soldiers in Japan, yes, uh, did a sexually assault uh, Japanese women. Uh, so this is a war crime uh, that is uh, very ancient uh, and uh, it really goes back to how men view women, particularly when men are at their most aggressive vis-a-vis uh, -vis each other in times of war. And uh, I hope that we can focus uh, on the broader issues and not have this be a tug of war between nationalists, extreme nationalists in Japan and uh, uh, Koreans and others. Uh, second, uh, I hope uh, that we can recognize uh, that uh, the field of law and economics has a great deal uh, to contribute uh, when the fundamental assumptions uh, behind any proper economic analysis are understood. Uh, game theory, I have used in my own writing about uh, corporate lawyers and business organizations, and game theory assumes uh, usually uh, rational actors and second, consent and bargaining power. I cannot imagine a situation with less bargaining power, with less evidence of consent than the present one that we are examining here, where we have women, some girls as young as 10 years old, who are living in a country that was colonized by Japan for decades, uh, in a wartime, supposedly entering into a contractual commitment with the Japanese Imperial Army. Girls as young as 10. I don't know a jurisdiction, certainly in the United States, where the age of consent is, a, a, is 14 or below. And it's usually 16 or higher in many jurisdictions. In Japan, in Japan, they understand that. And how can a professor of law and economics or any educated person opine that a woman uh, can enter into a contract in such conditions, even a grown woman enter into such a contract where her country has been subjugated by the army, 
of another country, to have sex with up to 40, 60 soldiers a day, and then we bring children into the equation. I ask that my fellow scholars, whether of law and economics or law and other fields, think about the people, the people who are affected by our actions, by the actions of others and actions that we may encourage in the future when we excuse this type of crime, this treatment of women by man, this type of aggression and denialism. And we cannot deny the war crimes of World War II or any other war crimes, including what the United States did most recently in torturing our prisoners in the war against terror. We cannot deny that. We have to confront facts. We have to confront the facts of what happened in World War II. I've asked many fellow Americans to reconsider whether we should have dropped the bombs, two atomic bombs on Japan. Quite clearly, a lot of the evidence is showing that that was unnecessary. We need to revisit history and ask hard questions, but ask hard questions based on facts, not based on fiction, not based on fake news. And I wanna emphasize that fake scholarship is as damaging, if not more damaging than fake news. Because when a professor at a renowned university, whether it be any of our institutions or Harvard University, pronounces a fact, the press will pick up on that, particularly those elements in the press who want to push a certain agenda in advance that story, that narrative. And this narrative was not backed up by any historical facts. The author did not understand the Korean language, did not examine a single contract in the Korean language. There were no facts supporting this article. This was not game theory because there were no rational actors. There was coercion and there was coercion, not only of adults, but of children. This is a tragic episode for us, the United States. This has, says something about us, that this type of work could be viewed as scholarship and pass so-called peer review. I don't understand, I've tried to understand the peer, peer review process in this journal. I do not believe that any historians were consulted. A historian would spot immediately that there are no historical documents there's no evidence, no facts backing this up. It's all theory, theory without facts. And I will emphasize that theory can be powerful and give powerful explanations and true explanations for what has occurred in some instances. But theories can also sometimes be tragically wrong, conspiracy mm -hmm. theories. And I want to emphasize how important it is that we seek the truth, we hold each other accountable to seeking the truth. Yeah. And unfortunately, this paper was a lie. I'm sad to say that. I look forward to having a continued conversation about it. Thank you so much, Professor Painter. Um, and now we have the pleasure of turning it over to Phyllis Kim and Eong Su. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, 밝히고 거짓을 바로 잡아 주셨다는 말씀을 들었습니다. I heard that the professors here with us today and more have actively stepped up to correct the wrong when a Harvard law professor issued a misleading and distorting article about the Confra women issue. 우리 학자님들도 
Turun. Hepsi. <gülüyor> 우리 할머니들이 증언을 하는 데는 많은 용기가 필요한 했습니다. It took us a great deal of courage for us to come out and testify. 우리 학자님들도 드럼 없이 나서 주시기 때문에 거짓이 드러나고 진실이 성의했습니다. 정말로 고맙습니다. The lies were exposed and the truth have triumphed because the courageous scholars who have stepped up and spoke up. Thank you so much. 응? 됐어, 됐어. 그럼 말리스탄. 네, 오케이. 음, so I think at this point we'll move to questions. Um, and so I think my first question, the first question we have, um, is again for Eong Su, and. It's why do you think that denialism regarding the comfort women keeps happening even among scholars? The Hemonic Chimuni Drosayo, Ricky, uh, who you look at Hakjado Sai Esodo, Keso Keso, Yoksa Pujang, Kesuk de Wichanao, who you got Bora was in the Kashinika? Ilvone Hamundo Kupje Bobodo. 양부 문제에 대해 판결을 받은 것이 없지 않습니까? 그래서 망언을 계속하는데 그러니 국제사법재판소로 가서 판결을 받자는 거입니다. Japan is continuing to deny and revise history because it has never been tried for the crime of the comfort women in an international court. That's why I am advocating for the referral of the comfort women issue to the ICJ. Great, and we have a couple more questions for Yong Su, and I know it's uh, very early over there. Um, what do you want to see people in the United States do to help on acting on the issue of comfort women. 미국 사람들이 어, 이 어, 위안부 문제를 해결을 위해서 어떻게 도와드렸으면 좋겠습니까? 이제 그런 질문이에요. 미국의 모든 학교에서 위안부 문제를 가르쳐야 합니다. The comfort women issue should be taught in all American schools. Thank you. Um, well, and then I oh, guess if not, it's not done yet. Yeah, <laughs> The comfort women issue was an unprecedented scale of women's human rights and uh, human rights violation and a crime. 과거를 잊으면 반복됩니다. 반드시 가르쳐야 합니다. If we forget history, we're doomed to repeat it. We must teach it so it's not repeated. 그리고 민 의원님 국제사법재판소에서 위안부 문제가 판결을 받을 수 있도록 지지하는 결의안을 
통과시켜 주세요. I also have a request for Senator Min. Please help press a resolution supporting my request to take the comfort women issue to the ICJ. 꼭 부탁드립니다. I sincerely ask you to do this for all of us. 감사합니다. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. We'll see what we can do. I, I want to, I'm sorry, we're running a little short on time. So I wanted to just move along with a few questions here. And we have a number of questions in the chat as well. Feel free to continue asking those. Uh, my first question is for uh, Dr. Che. And you talked about game theory. Um, Professor Painter talked about his problems with the paper, uh, the Ramsier paper, uh, that, that it presumed uh, consent and choice and autonomy. Um, and the game theory kind of assumes this, but this was absent. What are some of the other problems with this article for a lay audience from your perspective uh, in terms of sort of the broader context of game theory where you're an expert in law and economics? I mean, the main problem, as everyone else has been saying, is that it advances an idea which is not supported in evidence and it's just patently false and it's also deeply dehumanizing. That's the main issue. So I wouldn't say that the, there are, it, the problems which it has with, are about game theory are secondary, I would say. And um, I wouldn't say that the, you know, what he says, you know, is not like completely nonsensical or something. I could see somebody making an argument. The argument is basically like the kind of contract that people used reflected the kind of uh, incentives which they were in. But, you know, that, that argument, first of all, it doesn't, in the paper, he doesn't do much more than other than assert it. And, um, you know, as a game theorist, you'd usually do a little more than that. You'd actually try to drive it or be more, more specific about it. Um, but the main problem with it is, is not that. The problem is that, like uh, Professor Painter said, is that it assumes that people um, care about, like, the wages and, you know, the work effort and all these things, where really the operative incentives are those of violence, that people did what they did because they were forced to, because they're forced under threat of violence. So if the main thing which is influencing people's choices is violence, then that has to be part of the model. And um, the fact, and if you say that they're not there, then you're basically excusing away violence. You're, you're just, you're saying something which has no relevance to the situation at hand. So um, I think that, you know, game through any other, you know, meth economic methodology does not allow you to make up facts. You know, it doesn't allow you to sort of say things which aren't true. It's not some sort of magic powder. You can say, hey, then not is true. Um, and what's really, really bad is that people think that this is the idea that people might think that you can use it for this such things. And so I just want to be super clear that, you know, um, you know, all scholars care about facts. We care about the things which happen in the world. And we, we don't like it when people say things which aren't true and which are not based on the evidence. That's true for anyone, not just historians. That's true for any scholar. And, uh, um, you know, that defends me as a game theorist, as a scholar, as a political scientist, as an economist. So, um, you know, it's, I think it's really, you know, there's, you know, in, in the within the field or the arena of game theory, there really isn't much to talk about in this article. It's just so minor. It's the, the claim is little more than assertion. And it's really just um, very, very disappointing in that in some sense it uses it as a cover. That's not in some sense, it uses it as a cover to yeah. make these terrible claims. And I think that's just really, really bad. That's the opposite of what we should be doing. If you have a, a methodology that should be used to understand, to analyze, not to shield yourself from criticism and yeah. to um, make yourself sound more scientific than you are. Thank you. Uh, my next question is for uh, Do Dr. Duden. Um, we've received reports that a number of scholars who've organized responses to this article uh, especially women scholars have been harassed by different right-wing groups and individuals. Um, first of all, is that, has that been your experience? Uh, can you talk about uh, what we might do when we think about laws or actions that the government might take to fight back and protect uh, your academic freedom uh, against harassment and um, you know, just be interested in your thoughts in this area? Sure, thank you for the question. Yes, uh, this has been happening to me personally since the year 2004. 
Um, and I have been extremely fortunate to work at institutions that have taken it seriously. I also work in the state of Connecticut, which takes this seriously. Uh, and so at least there's follow up. I have colleagues actually at Irvine uh, that have also been uh, harassed and targeted. And so I know California also takes this seriously. I think the, the important thing for everybody in, in this room to understand really quickly is we're privileged in the United States to be receiving the attacks on this particular topic. But as Professor Painter had mentioned earlier, what's happening in this particular instance relates to a, a bunch of denialist uh, impulses going on, uh, not unique to the Japan-Korea dynamic at the moment, very much at home in the United States. And so really understanding that some of uh, some very hot button issues right now are leading to either, I have three categories, annoying, threatening, and then death threat. And, you know, the latter being illegal. Uh, but you know, the, these, these are actually real. And uh, if you're a US scholar studying American history, they could be actionable. In our case, uh, I chalk this up to pretty, you know, it's bullying, it's internet bullying. Uh, for those of us working in the United States, I don't mean to downplay it at all. I believe in opening it up in uh, putting oxygen on it and making it known. Surprisingly, including the death threats, uh, the people who issue them to me and my colleagues, a number of us are receiving them at the moment, um, they sign their names. They come from IP addresses that could be followed up. Whether that is something, I mean, I think the important thing is what's the point of doing this? As, as Grandma Lee says, the important point is educating students, everybody about this particular history. One final brief thing. However, if you are a scholar researching this topic in Japan, and I saw in the chat, there's some questions about that. So I'll try and bring this in. If you're a scholar researching this history inside Japan, there are people actually, uh, there's actionable violence taking place. Collectively, we have a colleague whose office has been firebombed. We also have a colleague who was so defamed and had his family threatened that they had to leave the country. And so, you know, this is for those of us who are privileged in the US backed by institutions that guard our academic freedom, we're in a position of responsibility to educate and make known that people are threatening us. If you're somebody in Japan, you have, you're running a physical risk. And I think we do need to draw attention to that as well. Thanks. Thank you, Professor Duden. Uh, my next question is for um, Professor Xu. Um, you focused in your research on comfort women from China. I was wondering if you might elaborate if there are differences between the comfort women from Korea and China. Uh, what do you think about Professor Ramsier's focus on comfort women from Korea? Uh, and then I guess the as a historian, and this question could also apply to uh, Professor Duden, uh, is there any partial truth to this that some women were actually recruited while others were sex slaves. Yeah, thank you. It's a very uh, important question. Um, I, I, as I mentioned a little bit earlier when I talk, even some of the women, they were uh, given advance money due to the, you know, poverty of the family situation and taken into the conversation. We cannot forget this is a, in the context of the war. These women, they, they are not the normal prostitute. Um, just like the report I cited uh, earlier, in news, uh, the art, journal article, they call these comfort women comfort objects instead of uh, you know, prostitute. That's the, the people at the war time, they, they their understanding and actually that's the reality of these women. Even women from Japan, Japanese empire, um, their status in the hierarchical comfort woman system might be different from the uh, women drafted from the occupied area. They are still sex, sex or slaves. Um, they, they, they don't have freedom, not like a Professor Ramsey said, they can freely enter and exit the system. 
Um, actually, I remember there was a uh, online article by a Japanese uh, writist, writer, a former soldier. He commented on this woman, say this is a Korean woman was sold to the comfort station by her own parents. Um, she, he put the, this article trying to demonstrate that these women are prostitutes making money in the front lines. However, the, the words cited by this soldier clearly demonstrated these Korean women's uh, working condition actually is uh, like a slave. The woman says they have to you know, service 30 or more soldiers a day and uh, without stopping, sometimes have no time to eat and many committed, committed suicide. So these women, whether they are drafted from Japanese colonies or Japan, or they are from the occupied area, the entire picture of the comfort station is sexual slavery. You know, I, I think, uh, you know, the denialists in Japan, they try to frame this issue as a diplomatic uh, dispute yeah. between two countries. Yeah, right. so to cover up the, the nature of the, you know, the cr crime. Thank you. Um, my next question is for uh, Professor Painter. Uh, we heard some harsh uh, rhetoric here um, describing this article, denialism 101, no evidence, uh, scholarly malpractice, uh, this was right-wing dog whistles, fake scholarship, fake news. Um, and I take it that the consensus of this panel is, is that this is very problematic scholarship. So I guess what I, my question for you is, <clears throat> what do you see as the lines between academic freedom, intellectual integrity, uh, poor scholarship and outright dishonesty? And what, if anything, should the United States, its academic institutions, other professors do to maybe police itself? Well, I have never suggested that Professor Ramsayer should lose his post at Harvard. Uh, he is tenured, and in the United States, a tenured contract is very, very hard uh, to reverse, and that is the way it should be, uh, to preserve academic freedom uh, for all, uh, including those of us who would uh, uh, criticize Professor Ramsayer's work. Indeed, the overwhelming uh, majority of historians, economists, uh, lawyers, law professors who have criticized his work. I have seen uh, virtually nobody uh, with any respectable reputation who is willing to defend this article by Professor Ramsayer. And, and still, I would not call for his removal from his post at Harvard. That's not the answer. The answer is what we are doing now to repudiate him. And let's go back to the fundamentals. This is about exploitation exploitation of women by men, exploitation of a dominated country, Korea, by the Imperial Army of Japan. Uh, exploitation is as old as human civilization. Uh, the exploitation of the Jews as slaves in Egypt, the exploitation of slaves, African-American slaves in the United States, uh, the third president of the United States, Thomas Jefferson, who probably uh, had sex apparently with a uh, enslaved person on his plantation. Uh, this is a uh, phenomenon that has occurred over and over again in human history, exploitation. And how could any, any person apply game theory to this type of a relationship, this asymmetry of so-called bargaining power when one side has no bargaining power? in the situation, yeah. uh, and not to mention the children involved. And, and that is what we need to do is condemn this type of uh, masquerade for scholarship. This is not scholarship. It never should have passed peer review. And we need to continue to ask the journal editors why they wish to publish it when there ha can, has been no peer review by credible economists or historians who are willing to support this. I appreciate that. And I just want to say for the record, I don't think anyone on this panel or any academic that I know of has called for uh, Professor Ramsier to lose his yep. tenured position as a result of this. Uh, but I did want to, if you guys, uh, the rest of the panelists might give their quick thoughts, what can we do to police academia? As a former academic myself, I, I expressed in my outset, 
Uh, this is deeply concerning because I do see academics as the guardians of the truth, and this is a major blow undermining us. Uh, so maybe in 15 seconds or less, I know we're not used to speaking briefly, but if you have any thoughts on what we can do, uh, would, would be grateful. Uh, maybe uh, Professor Duden, let's start with you. I, it's uh, it's Duden. Sorry. Duden, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, uh, we should treat this as if it were a biology paper. There's no evidence. Retract it. Thank you. Uh, Professor Chu or Professor Che, do you have any thoughts? Uh, yes, I think uh, some, uh, you know, investigation might need to be need, uh, needed to, uh, to see how this review process took place. I also have conversation with my colleagues and some asked a similar question um, and wondering whether the, the review process didn't involve people who are really familiar with the history of a comfortable woman. Maybe it's just uh, you know, law professors or economic professors, they are looking at the theoretical framework and uh, without a careful consideration, what the paper is yeah. really saying. Yeah. I mean, I would just agree with everyone, what everyone else says. I mean, I agree that the, the process of how it was accepted should be investigated. And of course we should call for its retraction. And I agree with Professor Painter saying that the fact that it was even published at all does say something about the United States and about the state of academia and the state of, you know, law and economics and state of maybe, you know, our whole fields in general. So we should, it's a time for us to really reflect and think about, are we doing our jobs and are our institutions doing the right thing? And I, all I'd want to say is that, you know, we do trust a lot in academia and we basically, the whole thing is based on an assumption of good faith that people are trying to tell the truth. But if somebody is not trying, that is they're acting in bad faith, it's actually pretty hard to deal with that other than just saying, hey, we're just not going to accept this article. I mean, you know, so much of it is based on the idea of, you know, mutuality, you know, I'm talking it out. But if someone has bad faith, what can you do? So that's what I'm concerned with is, is that if someone really just wants to try hard to just inject ridiculous ideas for, you know, terrible political reasons in the scholarly, you know, record, if they try hard enough, they can do it, you know, in some journal or another. And so I feel like, you know, that's something which we really have to confront in a more direct way. Thank you. Well, I, I just want to uh, thank everybody. This was a, a very informative session. And I know we probably could have gone for several hours more. I will say for a panel of academics, we're only a few minutes over time. I think that's pretty <laughs> impressive. Uh, I want to give a special thanks to all our panelists tonight and uh, also to E. Young Suhamani and Phyllis Kim. It was my honor to host this wonderful event. Uh, I, I'm going to kick this over to Phyllis Kim and E. Young Suhamani who have a closing message. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you. 저도요 세계의 피해자들을 명예회복을 해줍니다. 우리뿐 아니고 세계 여러 나라 피해자들한테 저는 명예회복을 하기 위해서 여러분들이 싸워주시는 거 저는 이깁니다. 여기서 여러분들이 세계 피해자들한테 마음 놓고 제가 이깁다 할수 있도록 해주십시오. 이겼습니다. The reason why I am in this fight is not just for us or myself, but for all victims around the globe who have uh, their uh, honor and dignity violated. So when you fight with us, you are fighting for all of us, including the victims from uh, around the globe. And we will win. And uh, I know we will win. Thank you so much. I love you. Uh, thank you, everybody. And I know we didn't get every question, but I hope that, that we will use this as a springboard to continue a further discussion. Uh, thank you again, everyone. Have a good night. Thank you.